Welcome to CCS Insights predictions for 2022 and beyond. I'm delighted to make my first introduction to our annual predictions event since assuming the role of CEO in January this year. Predictions has always been a highlight of the year and a valuable forum for engagement with the industry. This year is no different and we have a great agenda for you with a strong lineup of spokespeople from CCS Insight and across the technology industry, including Amazon's Ring, BT, IBM, Intel, and Samsung. A big, big thank you to all our sponsors. Now we are changing the format a little this year. We understand the pressure on people's time and the need for short, impactful sessions that combine analyst and industry executive insights. We've consolidated the agenda into three sessions across three days with each one totaling no more than an hour. So let me briefly outline the themes for you for the three days. Day one is our new flexible lives. Angela Ashenden will assess the changes that are happening in our social and working lives and the blurring between the two. Marina Kocheva will explore how consumer relationships with technology are changing and assess the need for companies to protect user privacy in discussion with Leila Rui from Ring. We'll also consider the ways consumer brands are trying to help individuals achieve a greater work-life balance and the impact of new technologies. Ben Wood, Leo Gebby, and Izzy Tal will look into the future of the smartphone and the era of on-person computing. We've got a great panel session with Samsung to explore all these themes. Day two is about the new imperative for tech. We look at the different trends emerging as a response to pressures facing organizations from consumers, public institutions, and investors to comply with environmental, social, and governance imperatives. Marina Koicheva will explore the consumer perspective, and Martin Garner will consider the impact that IoT will have on sustainability. Nick Maguire will delve into the actions the cloud providers are taking to address this area. Completing the end-to-end -end perspective, Bola Ratibi will address the developer angle and discuss this with Howard Beauville, head of IBM's hybrid cloud platform. Finally, day three will explore the future of networks. Connectivity has never been more important, but the network needs to have become more flexible and agile to deliver the benefit. This session, led by Kester Mann and Richard Webb, will look at network transformation as the 5G rollout matures. We'll explore two industry perspectives as we're joined by BT CEO for consumer products, Mark Alera, and Intel's Yaniv Garty. Our hope is that we provide you with a broad picture of the change technology is enabling in our lives and the change that it's resulting in for our industry. If the last 18 months has shown us anything, it's that change is rapid and its consequences far reaching and complex. Our hope is that we provide you with a broad picture of the change technology is enabling in our lives and the change that it's resulting in for our industry. If the last 18 months has shown us anything, it's that change is rapid and its consequences far reaching and complex. There's never been a more fascinating time to predict the future. We won't always get it right, but we aim to provide you a unique perspective through the 100 predictions we've prepared this year and insights that dig into the bigger picture. Please do share your thoughts via social media using the hashtag CCSPredicts. It would be great to have you join the debate. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy predictions 2022 and beyond. Over to Angela to get things started. One of the fundamental shifts to our lives over the past 18 months has been a drastic reimagining of the concept of the workplace. The shift to widespread remote work in the pandemic and the recognition that we can actually be effective when working away from the corporate office means that we have truly reached the point now where work is no longer somewhere that we go, but rather it's something that we do. 
The work from home experiment has not always been easy on employees, especially for those balancing homeschooling or caring for families at the same time. But it has shown the benefits of a more flexible approach to working, and employees are keen to keep remote working as an option going forward. Our survey research shows that three quarters of employees in roles suited to home working want to continue working from home at least some of the time once the pandemic is finally behind us. And business leaders are embracing this too, to the extent that we are now entering a new era of hybrid working, with many employees dividing their time between the corporate office and working from home. But while there may be opportunities for cost savings for businesses due to fewer employees being in the office at once, hybrid working is about so much more than just where we work. It has implications for how we work, both in terms of our collaboration with our colleagues, but also working independently, and it also has implications in terms of the tools that we need to get work done. We've become very used to video meetings in recent months, and these will continue to be important as we shift to a hybrid work model. But we've seen the impact of our over-reliance on video meetings with the rise of Zoom fatigue and its consequences for employee well-being. The effort to ensure everyone remained connected during the pandemic has meant many businesses have over-pivoted towards real-time, synchronous collaboration tools like chat and video meetings. The problem is that these tools assume that everyone is working on the same thing at the same time. They don't allow for people juggling multiple commitments, or for teams working across different time zones, or for simply allowing time for focused, independent work. But as businesses embrace more flexible approaches around hybrid work, we need to allow for teams to work collaboratively but asynchronously. And as such, we predict that exhaustion with online meetings, combined with increasingly misaligned working hours, fuels demand for asynchronous collaboration tools in 2022. Not only is it vital to ensure teams can continue to be productive in a hybrid work world, it's also important to ensuring the well-being of business's most precious resource, its employees. The pandemic has prompted many to re-evaluate their current role, and businesses are feeling the pressure to ensure that they provide the best support for, and opportunities for their employees. The employee experience and its connection to employee engagement has been a, a growing area of awareness for businesses for the past few years, but we're now seeing companies actively investing in strategies and technologies that target employee experience. Technology plays a crucial role here, with three quarters of employees saying that it's important in their selection of a new employer. And that's why we are predicting that concerns about staff retention following the pandemic drive a surge of investment in tools to improve the employee experience in 2022. Some of this will be about investing in technology to take some of the frustration out of people's day-to-day -day work, for example, through tools that automate some of their most manual, repetitive tasks. But we'll also see a renewed focus on continuous learning and development, helping employees to identify opportunities for growth and personal development that will enable them to build their career without feeling the need to leave their company. And of course, for businesses wanting to improve the experience for their employees, the shift to remote work brought a new set of complications, since it's difficult to know how to improve the employee's technology experience when you no longer really control it or even have visibility of it. Traditional approaches to monitoring technology services don't really work so well when your employees are not on the corporate network in the corporate office environment. At the same time, managers have found that it's much more difficult to keep an eye on how their team is working together and on levels of employee stress when the team is distributed. And so we've seen a wave of interest in employee experience monitoring tools that extend IT's reach to the home working environment, variously tracking and analyzing the performance of employee applications and devices, uh, the way that people are using their tools and their sentiment at work. However, our research shows that there is significant concern among employees about their employer using monitoring tools to track well-being and productivity. And we are predicting that in 2022, a focus on employee productivity monitoring prompts a backlash from employees, culminating in successful litigation. This could be, for example, in relation to invasion of privacy or perhaps through misuse of the data by management. But the results have the potential to be explosive and hugely damaging to employee trust. 
our work and personal lives have never been so intertwined. And this is just one area where business leaders will need to rapidly adapt, working with employees to understand the best way forward in this new hybrid working era. Unsurprisingly, my colleagues working in consumer research see the same themes of technology fatigue and privacy pervading the devices space. And now I'll hand over to Marina, our VP of Forecasting, to explore this in some more depth. Our lives are rapidly becoming more connected. And one of the key enablers of this change is the growing number of connected devices we own. The average household in the Western countries owns over nine connected devices. This means almost three and a half devices per person. How ownership of connected devices develops over time is one of the main focus areas of our new connected consumer radar, a recurring survey we conduct in Germany, Spain, the United Kingdom and the United States, where we ask people what devices their household owns, how they use them, how long they expect them to last, what they think they may own in the future, how they feel about repairing devices and buying second-hand devices, and what they think of device makers' environmental efforts. The study covers 18 types of devices we can find in a household, from connectivity and productivity devices like mobile phones and computers, to entertainment and lifestyle devices people use personally or at home, to smart home devices like smart doorbells or robot vacuum cleaners. In addition, we check how much people know about some upcoming devices, for example, smart glasses or smart tags. One of the most interesting learnings from the first wave of our radar is the extent to which the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the place of connected devices in people's lives. We know that the role of devices in our everyday life has grown. They kept us working and learning from home. They helped us keep in touch with each other, shop, entertained us, and so on. But exactly how much difference has the pandemic made? Quite a lot shows our research. Across the four Western countries, 48%, almost half of all households, have purchased at least one connected device because of the pandemic. 61% of households use at least one device more often now than before the pandemic. And 65% of people value their devices more highly now than before the pandemic. And importantly, this change towards higher engagement levels with connected devices is likely to be permanent. The vast majority of people expect to continue to use their devices as often as, or even more often, once the restrictions to life are fully behind us. So this paints quite a positive effect of the otherwise dreadful pandemic on the connected device industry. However, we should remember that crises like this don't hit every country and every household in the same way. Richer countries are well on their way to economic recovery, but poorer countries lag behind. And even within the richest countries, the economic effect of the pandemic is uneven, hitting badly some households where people have lost their livelihood and seen their savings diminish. In fact, in the UK, almost one in four households and in Spain, one in three are worse off as a result of the pandemic. Other households, however, have seen their savings increase considerably. And this asymmetric effect of the pandemic will cause further changes to the connected device market. We predict that the European mobile phone market will polarize further in 2022, with demand gravitating to the premium tier and the low end and away from the mid tier. But let's look at the opportunities this pandemic has created. We predict that in 2024, 5G cellular connected laptops will account for 20% of PC sales. This development has been anticipated for a while, but it hasn't materialized just yet. But the pandemic will kick it off, not least because students graduating over the next decade will regard cellular connectivity in laptops as an essential feature, driving adoption in the workplaces they join, much to the benefit of telecom operators. Another area positively affected by the pandemic is the smart home. People have spent a lot of time in their homes recently, 
and there is a significant focus on spending money on home improvements. We have seen this across the globe, from China to Western Europe. Our connected consumer radar shows that of the devices people don't yet own, the highest intention to buy is for smart home devices, smart doorbells in the UK and the US, smart lights in Germany, and robot vacuum cleaners in Spain. Of course, this is helped by the fact that these types of devices have a limited current adoption, so they have a lot of room to grow. But the fact is, they have captured the interest of consumers. But this is not to say that we are at the brink of a smart home revolution. We expect that homes will not become smart quickly, certainly not with the speed we've seen in adoption of tablets or smart speakers. We predict that over the next decade, the adoption of smart home technology will develop on two different planes. Standalone solutions like smart doorbells and robot vacuum cleaners will see strong adoption over the next three years. But the advent of a more deeply integrated, highly connected home will take more time and it is aligned to the purchase of domestic appliances that have smart features by default and eventually join together to give a more complete smart solution. But who knows more about smart home devices than a company that has seen plenty of success in this area recently, Amazon. I am delighted to have been able to discuss the future of smart home with Leila Ruhi, president of Ring at Amazon. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with her. In this next part of the Predictions Day, we are going to discuss the future of smart home. Uh, and I have the pleasure to be joined by Leila Ruhi, president of Ring, part of the Amazon family. And welcome, Leila, and thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion. Thank you. It's nice to be here. B before we start, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your career and your role at Ring. Sure. So um, my career, I would say, has been a little bit of an unusual one. I actually started in the legal profession. So I joined Ring as its general counsel five years ago and served in that capacity for the first two years here. Um, and then transitioned into a business role three years ago. I think what really drew me to Ring in addition to the mission, which is making neighborhoods safer, which really resonated with me, um, was that I had actually bought a Ring video doorbell for my parents to use before I had heard about the opportunity at Ring. And it was such an easy to use product. My parents are not technologically savvy. Um, and so just the, the the fact that they were able to use it, even though they have difficulty using, you know, other technology and how much they liked it, how much I liked that they had it um, and, and what it enabled for me and my family was was so exciting that when the opportunity to work at Ring arose, um, it, it was really a no brainer for me. Now, before we talk about the future of smart home, uh, let me ask you a little bit about your observations from the recent past. Uh, because consumer behavior in, in relation to technology products typically changes pretty rapidly, but still gradually. But the global pandemic uh, created this big disruption, this sudden shock. And I wonder, in your experience, Leila, how have consumers changed since the start of the pandemic? And are these changes permanent, in your view, or will they roll back eventually if and, and when uh, the threat of COVID uh, subsides? Sure. I mean, I think some of the changes are permanent. I think, you know, over the last year and a half to two years, I think people have really developed a new relationship with their homes. And, you know, whereas the home has always been shelter over our head, I think it is now also a reprieve and a retreat from whatever's going on outside. It's a school, it's a park, it's a movie theater, it's an office. You know, our home is all these things and so much more to us. Um, and I think as a result of that, we, we really do expect more from our homes, and I don't think that is going to change anytime soon. At the same time, I think, you know, while we are all inside, we also are looking for more and expect more in terms of how we connect to the outside world, whether that is through better Wi-Fi connectivity or Alexa drop-ins or, you know, better conferencing and collaboration tools. I think we as consumers now, and as a result of our experiences in the pandemic, just you know, expect more. And, you know, my experience, 
Um, customer expectations don't usually go backwards. I think we, I think that will continue as a, as a trend going into the future. Uh, and has this change in consumer behavior changed also the way Ring sees the market opportunity or maybe even its mission? Um, I think that's a great question. Our, our mission at Ring is to make neighborhoods safer and that definitely remains the same. I think at Ring, we've always believed that for neighborhoods really to truly be safe, it, it takes a community effort and that safety does not happen on an individual basis. I would say that the pandemic has really solidified that for me, um, that it does take all of us working together to achieve the best results. And I think that we see that even in our efforts to contain COVID, but I think that really extends to all aspects of neighborhood safety. Um, I think beyond that, we've seen firsthand that safety and the sense of security provided by our products extends beyond those use cases that I think often come to mind, um, like security or protecting a package at your front door. Throughout the pandemic, we've really been humbled by so many examples of how our customers have relied on our devices for life and safety, and also just to stay connected to their loved ones when they when they couldn't. Um, and examples of that are families using our devices to just check in with each other in, in a safe way, or you know stories of grandkids talking and checking in on their grandparents using the two way talk on our video doorbells. Um, so in that way, I would say that. It has really, I would say, evolved our, our, our learnings on what safety is for our customers and how our products can be, can be utilized by our customers to really deliver safety for them um, in ways that we hadn't really expected previously. Uh, kind of first, let me ask you this. How, how can you ensure, how will you ensure that the next wave of less tech savvy consumers won't feel overwhelmed by all this digital technology that is growing it? place and role in our lives. How can people continue to, to use it and adopt it, even if they are not necessarily the biggest technology enthusiast? I think you're hitting upon one of the biggest challenges that all technology companies face is how do you make something that's you know, future thinking, but also easy to use and easy to adopt. And I will say, I, I think this is an area where Ring really excels. Like I said, that example with my parents, I don't think it was an anomaly that my parents found it really easy to use and love the product. It, it's, it's something that we place a lot of focus on at our company and really working towards keeping things simple for our customers, making setup and every aspect of using our products as, as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, and I think it's something we think in all realms of our business, including, for example, like privacy and security space. You know, a couple of years ago, we launched Control Center and our goal there was we know that there is now a lot of different options when it comes to privacy and security that our customers have. And we really wanted to centralize it, make it a really easy to use dashboard for our customers put it in plain English and really put it at the forefront and make sure our customers know what choices exist for them and how they can take advantage of those choices. Um, and I think, you know, that was specifically in the privacy and security space, but it really extends to all aspects of our product development um, from the hardware to every feature. You will often find that Ring does not launch features that other companies have. And the reason for that is you know, we're not certain that it, it delivers maximum value for our customers. It might create a more confusing experience. And we don't want to launch anything unless we think it's useful, easy to understand and done in the best way possible for us. Do you do you face a lot of skepticism uh, when you give people assurances um, about their privacy? Understandably, consumers question and want to understand what companies are doing to protect them and how we are using their data. Um, that being said, I do think, you know, I know at Ring, this is really paramount important to us. Customer trust is everything. And we know that our customers have many choices when it comes to who they choose to secure their home and to keep their family safe. And it's really up to us to, to build that trust and maintain that trust for our customers. And we know that we can't do that unless we are transparent and we are building a first-in-class privacy and security experience for our customers and it is an area where we invest a tremendous tremendous amount of resources and thought um, and it really we are aligned with our customers and wanting to protect them um, and really wanting to be as transparent as possible and giving them as many choices as we can in terms of what their ring experience is and how they can protect their personal information 
Right. And more broadly speaking, um, do you foresee privacy becoming a bigger or a smaller issue in the future? Because I can see both arguments here. You know, on the on the one hand, we let this complex technology into our homes and the technology is becoming more intelligent uh, and we are really letting it into the most intimate parts of our lives. So we may become over time more sensitive to privacy issues. But on the other hand, over the last 18 months, we sacrificed a lot of personal freedoms for the sake of safety, you know, safety of, of our own safety and the safety of other people around us. So maybe we will become less sensitive about privacy again for the sake of safety in the future. So which of these two arguments do you feel closer to? Which scenario do you think is more likely to materialize in the future? Sure. So, you know, I really don't believe that customers should have to give up privacy in order to have safety. And I would expect that privacy is going to become more of an issue for customers and more of a focus. Um, you know, I know certainly for myself, I have many, many cameras inside and outside my home. I use a lot of smart home products and I know how important it is for me. I want to know that, you know, only I have control over my videos and my data and my personal information. And I would expect as more and more customers begin to adopt these products and that we they become more ubiquitous, um, th that's gonna become an increasing concern for all customers. And it's really up to companies to ensure that we are doing our best to ensure that customers don't have to make that trade off so that they can use our products and still feel secure and still feel that you know their their personal information is under their control and that they know how their data is being used you mentioned previously the neighborhood um and i would like to ask you what role do you see in the future for emerging technologies like ring sidewalk does smart home really extend outside of the home and, and how far and i think it might be helpful if you just explain first what sidewalk is for those in our audience who may not be familiar with it um, so Amazon Sidewalk is a shared network that helps devices to work better. Um, what it does is it can help simplify new device setup, extend low bandwidth working range of devices, and help devices stay online even if they're outside of the range of home Wi-Fi. Um, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about the neighborhood and how as a collective we can do more than I believe we can as an individuals, and I think Sidewalk is a really great example of that. Um, you know, by sharing a, a teeny amount of your bandwidth that is going to be negligible to most customers, um, you know, you can enable really important uses like, for example, you know, finding a lost dog or keeping devices like life and safety devices online. And, and I think, you know, I would expect to see a lot more of that in the future. And I would expect to see many more use cases like that develop leveraging the sidewalk network. Great. Uh, but looking now into the longer term, um, the future of smart home, do you agree with the prediction that the truly connected home in which all or at least most devices will speak to each other is a good decade away? Or do you think it might happen faster or maybe more slowly or maybe not at all? Um, I do think it will happen. I, I think you are right that it is it's not in the immediate future. I think, you know, there's so many devices that are still being developed. And I think to your point earlier, it, this really is early days. So I think there is a lot of growth and improvement and development ahead of us. Uh, but at the same time, I do know it is a major focus, certainly within Amazon. We want our devices to create the best possible interactions for our customers and to work together, not only amongst our own family of devices, but even you know, with other 3P devices that we know our customers use and love. And I expect that is a priority throughout um, many technology companies. So, you know, I, I do think we will see big improvements in the next few years, but I think you're right that a truly connected home where all of your devices are speaking together probably is further out. And what do you think are the main factors that will help this happen uh, or rather factors that are holding it from happening uh, in in more in the more immediate future is it that people are still using legacy devices is it that the technology of devices talking to each other is not ready yet is it that companies are ready to collaborate in a way that they can make the the, the, the connected home or reality 
I think that's a really good question. You know, my perspective on it is I think there is still so much development and opportunity on an individual basis for device makers and for, you know, different technologies that I think perhaps that true interoperability and interconnectivity just hasn't been prioritized by by many companies. And that is something I would expect to change. But I, I think it is very doable that these companies that, and, and these products will work better together. I think, you know, I think it's in all of our interest to make sure our customers are having the best possible experience. So I do think it's coming, um, but, but I would expect it's, it is a few years out. And now let me ask you, uh, Leila, is there any prediction of your own you would like to share something about uh, the future of smart home or the future of safety uh, at home or any other prediction uh, about next year or, or the future beyond? Sure. So, you know, I don't know if this is what I actually think will happen or just wishful thinking, um, but I would say one area where I might expect to see a lot of acceleration in the smart home is just more proactive um, predictive maintenance in terms of smart home devices doing more to proactively prevent bad outcomes in the home, whether it's through preventing leaks, electrical failures, uh, warning you that a key appliance might fail or, or signaling other unusual behavior in your home. So hopefully as a homeowner, you, you can take some action before something bad happens. Um, in addition to that, I think there's just been a lot of advancements in terms of sensor technology, and I would expect to see more sensors embedded in smart home products that will give customers even more awareness um, and more precision in terms of what is happening in and around their homes. Thank you very much, Leila, for joining our Predictions Day and for sharing your vision for the future of smart home. Thank you. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. With a Ring Video Doorbell, you can stream HD video straight to your phone, so you can see and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are. Hey, you're on camera. Your package. Oh, great. Can you leave it around the back, please? Pizza. I'll be right there. And wherever you live, with hardwired and battery options, there's a Ring Video Doorbell to suit you. No matter who stops by or where you are, with a Ring Video Doorbell, you're always home. Learn more at ring.com. At Ring, we reinvented the doorbell. And now we're changing the way you look at home security with Ring Alarm, our most affordable security system yet. It's a fully customizing, easy installing, remote arming, home protecting, Alexa integrating. Alexa, arm Ring away. Okay. Crime deterring, siren sounding, camera activating security system that you can pick up and install yourself today. With Ring Alarm, you're always home. Learn more at ring.com. You've heard from Angela about our changing work lives and from Marina and Layla about our changing personal lives. And despite the proliferation of connected devices outlined by Marina, one device remains central across all these domains, the smartphone. Now, one of the questions I get asked most frequently is what comes after the smartphone? Well, the conclusion we've come to at CCS Insight is that the rectangular monoblock remains the anchor interface, at least for several years. But there's definitely innovation around the edges with the advent of flexible display technology. The most tangible examples of this today are phones that fold in half or open out to offer mini tablet-like experiences. And we've seen some great progress, particularly from Samsung, who you'll hear from later. Battery technology is an area that's held the consumer electronics industry back for years. I'm afraid I can't promise you any major breakthroughs, but I am encouraged by the investments we're seeing in the seemingly unrelated area of electric vehicles. Battery capacity and longevity is critical in that domain, and this can only be beneficial for other consumer electronics devices. With this in mind, we're predicting that we'll see the arrival of higher density, solid state lithium batteries in premium smartphones in 2024, and this could potentially double battery life. Not a game changer, but definitely a step in the right direction. There'll also be some shifts in other areas, with older generations of technology being retired as networks look to migrate valuable spectrum to 5G. We're predicting that support for 3G technology will disappear from leading smartphones by 2025, with the key drivers being the reduction in antenna complexity and a desire to make savings on licensing costs. 
We believe Apple will lead the charge on this by removing 3G support from the new iPhone in 2023. We're also seeing the advent of new connectivity options. For example, Layla talked about Amazon and Ring's efforts with its local area sidewalk network. Another technology we expect to see proliferating is ultra wideband or UWB. For those of you that haven't heard of UWB before, it's a short range wireless communication technology, a bit like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. It operates at much higher frequency and needs much less power. And it's ideally suited to being located quickly and rapidly communicating data. We predict this will become a table stakes inclusion for all smartphone makers, which will dramatically expand its utility. And we've already seen Apple using ultra wideband in its increasingly popular AirTags. And we're sure that you'll see this capability featuring in a wide array of accessories that can connect to smartphones using this low power local area capability. It won't be long before your TV remote control, car keys, luggage and other items can easily be located using the prolific mesh networks of smartphones that support the technology. Beyond these developments, there are some looming threats to the smartphone industry. By 2025, we predict that at least a third of iPhone sales in Western Europe will be refurbished devices. That proportion of secondhand sales could reduce the addressable market for new mobile phones. But in the case of Apple, at least it has its ongoing services revenue on both new and secondhand devices, which will help mitigate this. It's little wonder that phone makers are desperately looking for ways to drive ongoing revenue from smartphones beyond those hardware margins alone. A further challenge faced by device makers are the ethics of selling mobile phones in a world where consumers are more conscious of their consumption habits and the environmental implications. Is it really acceptable to replace your phone every few years? This is something that Marina will talk about in her session tomorrow. In fact, we believe the bigger story is not the future of the smartphone, but the increasingly connected pool of devices that we use in our daily lives, be that smartwatches, headphones, smart glasses, smart jewelry, or something else. At CCS Insight, we feel we're entering the era of on-person compute, and this will offer a world of possibilities where the combination of new sensors and augmented reality will allow users to get even more contextual information relating to the world around them. Follow this to its logical conclusion, and we could be starting to envision what we term as anticipatory computing, where our on-person compute devices provide a new layer of capability, enabling new and enhanced experiences. With this in mind, I want to hand things over to my colleague Leo, who leads our research on extended reality, to tell you more about this topic. At times, it can feel like we're on the verge of shifting to a futuristic world with more and more discussion about the next generation of computing beyond the smartphone and how extended reality will change our lives. I doubt you've escaped the ascendancy of terms like the metaverse, which has become an essential part of every tech presentation, especially those covering virtual and augmented reality. Apparently, the race to the metaverse has begun, even though there's no real agreement yet as to what the term means. In my view, something that does unite all the visions of a metaverse is the expectation of seamless connectivity to the virtual world, where we spend more and more time across both work and play in digital environments. In this regard, I don't think that the smartphone can remain the primary device for user experience. Instead, the constellation of technology around us, which Ben mentioned earlier, will play a greater role as a smartphone takes a back seat. We can see this in areas like wearables, where it's increasingly expected that smartwatches will become more important as a secondary point of connectivity, as well as a means of navigating digital worlds. For example, Facebook has spoken about how it sees wrist-worn technology as an input for extended reality experiences of the future through advanced movement tracking. Well, I think we'll see this in products in the near future, and I predict that we'll see gesture technology added as a headline feature on the Apple Watch by 2022. By this, I mean that the watch will become a more meaningful control input across Apple's suite of hardware and software, 
offering a more refined and advanced degree of bodily motion tracking. Apple is already putting together the building blocks for the future of extended reality, as we can see with its AR kit technology. And I think the watch will start to play more of a role in this sphere as a means of user control and input. Talking of extended reality, we've spoken plenty before at predictions about smart glasses and how and when these will reach the market. But one thing that's become increasingly apparent is the fact that these devices will need new approaches to connectivity. We're going to see far more in the way of technologies like cloud and edge computing, allowing for processing to be offloaded and leading to devices which are ever more capable while simultaneously lighter and slimmer. You'll be hearing more about this from my colleagues Kester and Richard in their predictions presentation. But I really do believe that the connectivity revolution is going to drive incredible developments across the device landscape. Just imagine the possibilities. On your smartphone, photographs you take could be uploaded and processed in the cloud and then downloaded back to your device again in the blink of an eye. If you even begin to imagine what this could mean for areas like extended reality, the possibilities are endless. I've talked openly about my excitement for smart glasses. I can't wait to see these launch over the next few years. But my excitement is tempered by some question marks, such as social barriers, which I think will prove critical to overcome in terms of challenges to adoption and in terms of privacy. Think back to the last smart glasses product which caught the mass market's imagination, the Google Glass. It was a visionary product, but I can't help but feel that some of the problems which made glass so infamous are yet to be overcome. Why did glass fail? Well, a couple of key reasons. One, it looked pretty ridiculous. And two, because people were uncomfortable with others wearing cameras on their face. In terms of aesthetics, the technology has come on leaps and bounds since then. Some of you might have noticed that the glasses I'm wearing right now are Ray-Ban Stories, which are powered by Facebook and use cameras and microphones to record content. They only weigh five grams more than normal glasses, which is amazing progress. However, they don't have any sort of AR technology on board, which will be more of a challenge to squeeze in. But looking at the privacy front, I think we've still got a long way to go. Over the last few years, we've all become more used to technology in all aspects of our lives, whether that's smartphones in everyone's hands or smart speakers listening out for our commands. But at the same time, we've seen more and more focus on privacy. Some major companies have fallen foul of respecting users' digital rights, and it's prompted many of us to question the level of personal data that we give away. For that reason, we're predicting that the forthcoming wave of smart glasses will spark a renewed backlash against the technology. Ultimately, I think a lot of the arguments which killed Google Glass will resurface, particularly in terms of privacy. And this will demonstrate the work that's yet to be done to ready the world for smart glasses, at least outside of the workplace, where these products are starting to take hold. One other fascinating area at the overlap of technology and privacy is in health and biometrics. And I'd now like to hand over to my colleague Izzy, who will be sharing some thoughts on this topic. It always amazes me when I hear Leo talk about the strength of consumer backlash to extended reality when many of us are already giving away the data that's most personal to us all the time through our smartwatches. And that's not just our health data, like our heart rate or sleeping habits or our intention to lose weight or if we're trying for a baby, but also our location at any given time, what we're spending, where we're spending, what we're listening to and more. But it's clear that over the last couple of years, smartwatches have evolved from being a nice to have gadget to a life-saving device. Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, described their health division as the company's greatest contribution to mankind. <laughs> now, this might seem a bit over the top, 
But in a COVID environment, as Leila and Marina mentioned earlier, we've become less skeptical or more desensitized about sacrificing personal freedoms in exchange for safety. And as they mentioned, we were happy to do so. But outside of COVID, I wonder whether consumers will demand to redress the balance of control over their personal data, whether this is through more user-friendly control centers like we see coming out of Ring, or from more stringent privacy laws and AI regulation. But regardless of ongoing conversations around privacy, what I think for certain is that the research and development arms race for wearables shows no signs of slowing. This year, blood oxygen tracking has become commonplace on new wearable devices. And Samsung, with the release of their Watch 4, are now attempting to give consumers an instant reading of their body composition, meaning what proportion of their body is fat, muscle, or skeleton. And we're seeing in our own research that the presence of these capabilities is top of mind for consumers with more sophisticated health tracking capabilities like blood pressure monitoring, blood oxygen tracking, and electrocardiogram measurement, all identified by over a third of respondents in our last survey as being important to them in their decision to make a purchase. So it's no surprise that we predict continued innovation on the horizon for wearables. This might include enhanced fertility tracking capabilities through temperature monitoring, or non-invasive blood glucose monitoring. And we're pretty certain that these physical sensors will arrive in the near future. But we also predict that companies will aim to make more use of the sensors already on board the device to carry out virtual sensing. By this, I mean interpreting data in the cloud from existing sensors to deliver new insights. For example, we predict that by 2024, Apple will add voice biometrics to its health platform. This would mean the smartwatch microphone would be used to detect a range of medical conditions, such as the onset of a stroke, by measuring changes in the voice. It will be interesting in the future to see how our relationship with consumer technology changes. Perhaps as we emerge out the other side of the pandemic, we'll have craved in-person social interaction and therefore be prized away from our devices. And I know this is something which is really important to Samsung. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass over to Ben, my colleague, who will be talking to Samsung about what they're seeing in the market. Thanks, Izzy, and welcome to Samsung KX, Samsung's flagship store in the middle of London. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Sharon Hegarty, who leads marketing for Samsung in the UK and Ireland, um, acclaimed mathematician, Professor Hannah Fry, and comedian Susie Ruffle. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, Sharon, let's talk to you first. Our relationship with technology during the pandemic has, has changed dramatically. Can you tell me a bit about what you've learned at Samsung um, during, during the pandemic and as we come out of it? Well, I think our relationship with technology has changed completely over the last 18 months. You know, as our lives have blurred during the pandemic, you know, working from home, homeschooling, the lack of physical contact, we've really relied on technology to keep connected. We've seen a real growth across our portfolio of products, from smartphones to tablets and also new computing, as customers have really invested in the best tech for their homes. And also, especially something like our new Galaxy Fold series as well, where we've seen the adoption of, of, of newer technology. But it hasn't just been about productivity and working from home, it's also about um, our health and well-being. So again, we've seen an adoption of our new, other new products, such as our watch Galaxy 4, for example, where we're seeing people wanting to monitor their own health and well-being. So we've had new advances in our watch technology with body compositioning and also um, sleep advancement as well, as people are getting more involved in their own um, well-being. Fantastic. And Susie, I think technology has had a big impact on, on, on you as a comedian, you know, used to being out with a live audience. What happened to you in the pandemic and how did technology help you? Well, I mean, instantly we went to sort of virtual gigs, which to begin with sounded like a horror show. But as we all sort of got used to it and realised that we weren't getting back into the clubs anytime soon, we all sort of found a way to make comedy work online. And do you know what? And now it really does. You know, we had to put in a lot of effort and work out what material to do and, and stuff like that. But now I think it's something that's going to stay for good. That's great. And I mean, I think in terms of technology in, in our lives, Hannah, we've got to this point where I mean, I live and breathe technology, so I feel overloaded. But I mean, what's your perspective on technology in our lives and whether it's 
a force for good or whether it's just too much and how we rein it in? Oh, I definitely think it's a force for good. I mean, I live and breathe technology here, as you do. Um, but I also think that there's a, there's a strange sort of paradox about more technology because each new element of new technology, a new thing that gets invented, a new thing that gets launched, has to simplify our lives in some way for it to be successful, you know. We wouldn't adopt new technology if it just made things more complicated. But in making our lives simpler, we also have this habit of just cramming more stuff in. I mean, I'm thinking about video calling, for instance. Mm. How much simpler is it that you don't have to travel to a meeting? Of course, but then of course, people try and cram in three meetings in the space where you would, we would only have one, meaning, you know, you're a bit, it's very difficult to think. So I think really it's about, um, I, I think really to get the most out of everything, it's, it's about taking all of the, the good parts of it, but knowing also when to step away and switch off from technology. And I think that's really interesting because I think, Sharon, I think in your team during the pandemic, you've taken some measures to actually try and help them cope. So can you talk a bit about what, what you did with your team and how you helped them cope with uh, kind of the pressures of this new working life? Absolutely. I mean, again, what, one thing about the pandemic, it brought us all a lot closer together. You know, I've got teams in Ireland and also we work globally across our teams with Korea and Europe. And all of a sudden we're having meetings where we're all in the same room, which again, helps um, in terms of collaboration and um, just communication in general, which was fantastic. But at the same time, having back-to-back -back meetings, you know, isn't great for anyone. So we blocked out 1 till 2 p.m. every day for someone to have, you know, for people to have their lunch hour. And also making sure that um, not every call had to be a video call. Make a phone call, go for a walk, getting, you know, it, phones, you, you can actually make a phone call with a phone. <laughs> remember those, remember those. So um, it was about, again, making sure that people got up and walked around. And actually, you know, having something like my Galaxy Watch on my, on my wrist, it's like having a personal trainer on my wrist because it actually tells me to get up if I've been sat there for too long. So using our own tech as well, um, we would do step challenges and things like that as well. So again, using our own tech to make sure that we were all keeping fit and well as, and um, you know, uh, throughout that time. And Hannah and Susie, I know you have been recording a podcast all about 5G experiences. I know you've been really astounded by what you've seen. Could you maybe share a couple of examples, each of you, of the things that kind of blew you away, particularly as we're at a predictions event. So you know, maybe you got a window into some technology that you know, we don't know about yet. Oh yeah, there was so much amazing stuff. I think for me, perhaps the, the most amazing uh, stories were about areas of, of the world which have kind of been bypassed by technology up until mm. now. And I'm thinking in particular about uh, the way that firefighters operate. Because if you think a firefighter, I mean, really, the, the state of the art is a clipboard and a walkie-talkie, right? Which is, I mean, it has been since, what, the, the 1980s, maybe? Um, but in our podcast, we, uh, we got to speak to some people who have pioneered this helmet that uh, has an infrared camera attached to it. But rather than it just sort of displaying an infrared image, it projects on the inside of the visor an outline of buildings in a, in a very you know smoke-filled room where visibility is almost zero. So you, you're kind of looking at this very simplified, almost cartoonish version of the real room so that suddenly you can go into a room and see the stairs over there, there's a fire there, and there's an individual in the corner over there. Yeah. Wow. And, and really the stories about this are that, uh, I mean, this is genuinely going to save lives. The number of people who have struggled to get out of burning buildings, firefighters who've struggled to get out of burning buildings, purely because of lack of visibility. And yeah. this, I think, is something that's going to make a so massive difference. Technology is a force for good. Susie, was there one that jumped out of you when you, you Do were you know, doing the podcast? There's so many. There's so <laughs> many. Um, the, the podcast is called Whatever Next, if people are interested in having a lesson, because we, we just spoke to so many fascinating mm. people. I'm thinking, actually, about HomeSense. Do you remember mm. speaking to people from HomeSense? So, such a great idea, a really great bit of kit. So, say you have an elderly relative who you're a bit worried about. They're maybe, they're not at a stage where they need care, but you're still, you're just wondering if they're really getting on okay. But you don't want to keep phoning, because actually that's going to put quite a lot of pressure on your relationship. Maybe they're not going to enjoy that you're sort of digging into their life so much. So you can get these, uh, these, these little bits of kit that go around the house that can sort of, that can know when they turn the kettle on. So you, you go, oh no, they've been up in the night. I should probably check in on them first thing in the morning. Oh no, they've, they've slept all the night through. This is good. Oh, they, they haven't moved today. We need to get round there immediately. And people were saying, do you know what? Not only has this really calmed my nerves with how, say for example, my mother is doing at home, but also it's really improved our relationship because they've stopped feeling like they're constantly being checked in on. 
and I don't need to feel like I need to do the checking. And that was just such a simple idea, yeah. such a simple story. But actually, the people that we spoke to, it was, it was tech making, just, just these tiny things but we're just making people's days and people's lives and people's relationships so much better. How technology can just, when it's used right, actually make us feel more human. I think yeah, that's the story that was, that Susan yeah. and I really love. That's, that's, that's really fantastic. I love it when technology is used as a kind of force for good. Talking of technology, phones have got pretty boring recently. You know, they've, they've become kind of this, this rectangle. They work really well. The reason they've got boring is because it's a form factor that just seems quite dominant. But at Samsung, you've been innovating. So... Um, I think we're on the third or fourth generation of your foldables, depending on how you count them. What have you learned from them so far and, and why are customers enjoying having them? To be honest, Ben, I think people were craving for something new. And, um, you know, we've seen a huge uh, positive reaction to our Galaxy Z Fold series. And that was the Z Fold 3 and the Z Flip 3 that we launched um, just a couple of months ago. That, you know, we're responding to a customer needs that people want productivity on the go, they want a bigger screen, but they also want it to be compact. Mm. So something like the Galaxy Z Fold 3, which, you know, allows you to, you know, multi-app with multi-app capability. You know, I could be making a phone call, I could be writing, writing notes and, um, you know, booking a restaurant all at the same time. So... <laughs> Such, Gets a bit confusing. Yeah. <laughs> such a busy woman. Such a busy thing. woman. But, um, um, you know, it's a response to, to customers to customers' needs and we're also seeing a real um, growth in the premium market of um, mobile phones as well, of the, the thousand pound mark that people you know, want a be better quality product. Um, but it's not just about productivity, it's also form factor. So something like the Galaxy Z Flip, which I know Susie's a fan of. Um, I, will, you know. <laughs> I will never go back, I was 30 before. These phones, I love how small they are, I love that it fits in my bag, but it's also, it's got the cool factor. As soon as you whip this out, People are interested. So Everyone... interesting, even just on the point that it's not a, so much the technology, it's just like, you know, really yeah. cool, you know, gadget bling that you, is a talking point. I had one of the really early ones last year. And, you know, I sat down for dinner with all my friends and everyone's got the same phone. Everyone's, it's so dull. It's so boring when we all have the same thing. And I whip this out. And it's talking point. People think it's really cool. And Hannah, um, for you? I think, I mean, we both got to have one of the early versions of this. I think the really nice thing about this phone is just the act of closing it, putting mm. the screen away. It's like, it's like switching off and being like, no, actually, now I'm not going to use my phone. Because when you have the rectangular one, I mean, I know you can kind of turn it off, but it's, you, it's sort of always there. You're sort of always thinking about it. And if you get a message, it's massive, mm. you know, whereas if you get a message on these, it's just a little thing that comes up here. You notification. Can, you, it's yeah, very sorry. useful, I think. Yeah, right. if you get a notification on that, you can decide whether you want to engage but when you've got it on a big screen it feels it's like oh I probably right should I probably should and I think you know people are accessing um, you know content in a different way you know even when you're at home you're more likely to you know watch TV on your on your phone than actually on a, on, on a TV half the time so you know we're consuming content whether it's TikTok or Netflix more and more on the go so that's what these products are also great for and we're here as part of a predictions event um, we've been rolling out nearly a hundred predictions at CCS Insight I would not want to miss the opportunity to ask all of you whether you've got any predictions on how you see the future. So Sharon, any thoughts on where you think technology is going or, or broader topics that you want to cover? For now, um, for me, the future is very much fold. Right. Um, you know, we've, Samsung, we've set that precedent now in terms of um, developing the technology for mainstream. So we'll definitely see more of these um, foldable products coming onto the market. Um, also 5G, um, as we've talked about, you know, I think it hasn't quite yet had its spotlight in mm. Um, it's time in the spotlight. As restrictions lift, you know, and we're out more and more, we want that seamless connectivity experience that we have in the home when we're out at about two. So um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more of that. And then finally, for me, you know, I want to see our technology used for good. You know, we talked earlier about, um, you know, barriers to people accessing comedy shows, but also it's about breaking down barriers for the workforce. So whether you're, you have limitations around geography or accessibility or disability, I want to make sure that our technology is used to break down those barriers so that everyone has the opportunity. Hannah, anything from you on a prediction? Oh, I mean, there's so many that we, that we managed to come across in the podcast. But I think for me, it's a, it's a lot about uh, 5G enabling 
the internet of touch or the internet of skills even. Mm. We talked to somebody who'd invented this incredible pair of gloves mm -hmm. which could essentially be controlled remotely, right? So using 5G to control them. And when you have that capability to, to essentially move somebody else's hands, which I know sounds creepy, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a way in which surgeons can teach each other techniques or where maybe one day your car breaks down, you go and get your internet gloves out the cupboard and then suddenly you become your own mechanic by downloading some sort of program uh, for your glove. So I think those kinds of things is, is, is where I see things going. Fantastic prediction. Susie? Do you know, I'll take it in a really personal route. What, one thing that really excites me is cameras on, on, on phones or cameras and on the, uh, the tech that we take out and about with us. You know, as a comic, I'm someone that I shoot a lot of telly and then also I'm thinking at the moment about shooting a special. And I think it's completely realistic to think that I could shoot a special on a Samsung phone. I could shoot it. You, know, you could have cameras all over the place. And I think, I think it sort of democratizes filming mm. because you know you could make a short film. You could put it into the Venice Film Awards. You know, it, it means that anyone can have a go. And I think that's brilliant. And also, I think that's where real creativity lies mm. because if yeah. it's just the same kind of people that have access to cameras and sound, we're going to get a lot of the same stuff. Mm. Whereas if you can say you can do everything with this bit of kit, yeah, I think that's really exciting. Mm. Mm. I agree. Well, that's. Just fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time today to share your views, your predictions. Um, it's been a great way to wrap the first day of CCS Insights Predictions and Beyond event. And hopefully everybody can join us again for tomorrow's session, which starts at the very same time again. And we hope we see you there. <laughs>